Hi, Jarrett. Hi, what Bob. What do you think about our dotted horse mint wildflower plot here? Oh, this is a fantastic pollinator plant. Hi, I'm Bob Hockmuth, county agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Suwannee Valley. And with me today is Dr. Jarrett Daniels, associate professor with the University of Florida Department of Entomology and also with the Florida Museum of Natural History. And uh, Jarrett has a special interest in pollinators of all types. And uh, we're interested in learning a little bit more about pollinators here today, Jarrett. So tell us when we think of the term pollinators, what does that include and what does that mean? So a pollinator is any organism that physically moves pollen from one flower to another flower of the same species and facilitates fertilization of that plant. And in the insect world, which are the heavy lifters of the pollinators, that includes native bees, hunt, the European honeybee, butterflies, beetles, flies, pretty much any insect that might visit a flower. So when we consider the overall environment, why would pollinators be important? Well, pollinators really are uh, a fundamental uh, group of organisms for the environment. Uh, if you look across the globe, about conservatively about 80% of all flowering plants on the planet require animals uh, to, to help with pollination. And so they're really the drivers of all natural systems as well as agricultural systems as well. And I know in agriculture, pollinators are very, very important and I think more important in certain crops. Uh, what, what is the overall uh, importance to agriculture? So if you look at agriculture in the U.S., just as an example, the European honeybee, just one species of pollinator, is really responsible for billions of dollars of productivity in that system. And so it really behooves us that we have a diverse pollinator group around to help maintain that productivity within those systems. And uh, crops, at least within Florida, that really depend on pollinators are things like blueberries, squash and watermelon, peaches, strawberries benefit. So it really is a a large part of our economic system that's dependent upon insect pollinators. So what are some of the examples of pollinators that we might find on some of our typical Florida farms? So it really runs the gamut if you look at insects from butterflies to beetles to flies to wasps, but the bulk of the really heavy pollination service lifting is done by bees, both native bees and the European honeybee. What is the status of the European honeybee nowadays? Well, I think, you know, since about 2006, we've seen declines nationally due to a lot of factors, including kind of that universal factor of colony collapse disorder. So we're seeing the number of hives dwindling and a lot of kind of angst within the agricultural community about what does that mean for my farm? What does that mean for the productivity of, of this type of system? And so I think if you look at the health of the pollinator world, we need to kind of approach it like the stock market. You don't want to have all your money in one stock, but you want to diversify that portfolio. So it really means that we need to look at other pollinator groups and particularly native bees to help with that um, potential decline of the European honeybee. So in our, in our uh, dotted horse mint plot here, I, I mainly see native pollinators or what yeah. appear to be to be native uh, pollinators and not uh, the honeybees. Uh, are they equally as susceptible to some of those problems? I think the evidence that we have today definitely shows that they are. And I think particularly in Europe and North America, we're seeing that there's a lot of evidence showing that these populations of native bees are declining due to loss of habitat, increases of insecticides, a lot of other factors. So trying to uh, better enhance habitats or maintain habitats for those native pollinators is only going to have spin-off positive effects on agriculture. So if we can increase the population of some of these native pollinators, can they enhance the pollination services in addition to the honeybee? I think there's a lot of evidence that says yes, that they can. And uh, that's one of the projects that we're trying to investigate with this wildflower plot is to look at how we can bring pollinators into the system more effectively and keep them in there and have the spinover effect onto the target crops with enhancing the fruit set and ultimately the productivity and the profitability of that individual crop. Are there any other general concerns that we might have in relation to the, the whole pollinator complex? I think just you know, having a diverse system around farms is really important because the habitat that these organisms depend on is, is just natural environment. And so they, they need a lot of available resources like pollen and nectar. They need nesting sites uh, and they need an environment that's conducive to them building up those populations through time. You mentioned uh, where these uh, pollinators nest, perhaps, and we're probably all familiar with the honeybee mm -hmm. and the honeybee hives. 
So within the habitat of the native pollinators, where do they actually live? So if you look at the native bees in the environment, about 70% of them are ground nesters. So they're looking for bare soil and they'll actually burrow into the soil and create nests underground and they'll have many chambers for their brood. The remaining about 30% of native bees are gonna be cavity nesters. They're gonna nest in old wood, maybe in the side of a building, in brush piles. So having kind of snags in the environment, dead wood, is gonna really provide a wealth of nesting resources for those native bees. I know in the project here over the past uh, few years, we've uh, been working on trying to develop some strategies to increase the native populations, and boy, have we seen some increases there. Uh, is that typically gonna be expected on farms? Can we expect to increase these native pollinator populations? Yes, and, and I, I, I think the first and foremost thing to do is to enhance the resources for their forage. So availability of nectar and pollen resources on or adjacent to agricultural systems is really key. That's going to provide all the resources they need to, for their own nutrition as well as for their developing brood and to help build up those populations through time. And since 70% uh, of them are ground nesting, it would seem like it would be important in the way that we manage the farm land, uh, minimizing tillage when it's not necessary and things like that, would that be important? Yes, very much so. Uh, one of the death blows to native bee uh, populations is tilling the soil because you're, dis you're disrupting those underground nests, you're killing off those individual um, uh, offspring of those native bees. And so you want kind of bare or semi-bare soil that's fairly compacted and free of tillage. And there's some pretty easy practices to implement on most of our farms uh, to not till any more than we have to and not necessarily clean every uh, tree off of the wood line and have some brush piles around. So those are important strategies that seem like they would be easy to implement on our farms. I know you've been working the past few years on a statewide project with wildflowers and pollinators. Tell us a little bit about that project, the objectives of it, and, and how that's worked out. So one potential strategy if we're looking at enhancing the pollination service to agricultural systems is to enhance or create habitat on farms. And one way of doing that is to have wildflower meadows like the one we're standing in. So that this provides a wealth of pollen and nectar resources to attract bees to the farm and hopefully that they'll spill over onto the target crop, but also allow them to breed on site and ultimately build up those populations through time with the goal of down the line saying that we're going to build up those populations. They're going to have more pollinators in the environment to spill over onto those cropping systems. That's very encouraging. In that research, did you find certain species or varieties of wildflowers that were, were, were better for the pollinators? So that's one of the objectives that we're, we're really looking at with this project. And so one very productive wildflower we're standing in today, and that's dotted horse mint. This is a, a mid to late season bloomer. It provides uh, a wealth of available nectar resources and attracts, as you probably can see, a multitude of different pollinators. But there are other flowers, uh, many of the genus Coreopsis uh, are great pollinator plants. Uh, a lot of the native sunflowers are excellent. Things like our native ironweeds are really, really good. Uh, and also things like Gallardia, uh, blanket flower that you might see along DOT roadways. Those all provide a wealth of resources that will attract and provide uh, food for those uh, roaming pollinators. So it sounds like rather than having one species of wildflower, it sounds like that's a pretty uh, wide range of uh, selections that we might have. How, how is that important in the overall plan for providing habitat for pollinators? Well, so different pollinators are gonna have different affinities for different species of wildflowers. So they visit the same types of flowers that they feel are most productive. And also, since they're found year round, or at least throughout most of the growing season, it's really important to have nectar and pollen resources throughout the entirety of that season. So you want spring flowering plants, you want summer flowering plants, and you want plants that bloom well into the fall. And in that way, you're gonna reach the maximum diversity of bees and ultimately help build up those populations through time. So not only having diversity of species, but diversity of uh, blooming times throughout the year, uh, that certainly makes sense. And I know here in, in this uh, dotted horse mint plot, we have a certain species, and uh, most of them tend to be a little larger uh, mm -hmm. species uh, within the pollinator group, but we're also using a lot of 
uh, crop strategies like buckwheat to mm -hmm. attract pollinators in, and they seem to have a whole different uh, range of, uh, of, of pollinators that move in. And we've even recently been doing some research with uh, the crop sesame, and sesame seems like it's even a third group of, of uh, native pollinators that are attracted, attracted in. So uh, is that, is that uh, typically what we would expect to see on a farm, that uh, we want to have a different range? Most definitely, and, and we know uh, relatively little about some of those characteristics, so that's part of the project that we have developed is to really evaluate these plants on a one-by-one -one basis so we can make better recommendations to growers and to uh, ultimately roll out a mix that will work well throughout many different regions around Florida. Well, Jared, I just would like to say uh, that the research that you've been conducting is innovative and, and really is uh, paving the way for us to learn how to, uh, to modify the practices on our farms so that we can uh, continue to implement these whole farm practices uh, to help with the overall IPM strategy. So we really appreciate the, the research that you've been doing and just in watching you for the last couple of years here on the farm, it's been incredible how quickly these native pollinators have been coming back using the direction that you've given us through your research. So thank you very much. Thank you.